Welcome back to Curse, Code, and Crown, a live play Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition podcast featuring a fully original world and campaign. I am the wizard Cronox, observer of time. Curse, Code, and Crown features our regular voiceover artists and improvisers, Laura Hamstra as the Orc Countess Ada and Princess Gwendolyn. Tyler Hewitt as Maka Deathcap, and Ryan LaPlante as Duncan Kindano, alongside our dungeon master, the incredible Tom McGee. So get ready for an adventure including thrills, chills, and hope for a brighter tomorrow. It's time for Curse, Code, and Crown! Though you have reclaimed control of the Spiros Observatory, uh, Sylvia Tome, the science gnome, has escaped. You have two of her stars unit um, that uh, you'd previously met uh, and have now fought against um, in your uh, control uh, as your prisoners um, mere moments ago. Not much time has passed as of yet. Um, you are standing in the observatory deck uh, of, of Spiros. Uh, you have Chris and Jill, um, two of the stars team, uh, and uh, also the large crystalline man uh, sort of at the center of the room. Uh, Sylvia escaped probably in combat time like 30 seconds ago, but the pod is gone uh, for now. What do you do? Uh, Duncan, standing with the rest of the group, would be like, we don't have a lot of time. Sylvia just went, but we don't know where. Ita, can you go look at the machines and figure out if we can call the pod back, where the pod went, all that business? Right away. And she rushes over. I mean, as fast as she can with her level two exhaustion. <laughs> Yamaka, you know the most about organics and inorganics in the cycle. Do you want to look at giant crystal man and see what we could do for them? Hmm. Yes. I wish to free him. Hmm. Yes. Well, let's determine who he is and what his goals are before we free him. This may turn out to be some kind of jail for evil, and we don't want to be mistaken about that. <laughs> and then these two. Uh, I'll tie them up and see what I can find out. So step one for him is just <laughs> binding the captives safely uh, and then trying to find information afterwards. So, Okay. Um, let's go through these in order of operations then. Um, Ita, how would you observe... What What's the process you would uh, apply to try to figure out uh, the machinery? Um, I think it's like... I mean, basically assess the control panel if there is a control panel yep, of some is. sort. And so it's just like she looks for the regular things. You know, there's like power on, power off. There are going to be various, various dials, various commands. If there's anything that's recognizable, if there's a logic to the layout, what is that? Cool. Uh, roll an investigation, please. Okay. Oh, and that's disadvantage, right? Oh, that was a nat 22. Um, so that is 21. <laughs> Still pretty fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Greater scheme of things. Um, 21, yes. So um, a quick uh, look at uh, the panels and um, the sort of uh, various things uh, shows that uh, it would seem the pod has gone to something called Nimbus Station. Um, Nimbus Station. That's yeah. not familiar, right? It is not. Uh, right. Malvern's Clinic. No, no one has talked about this. Uh, it's never been mentioned before. Um, you see a um, sort of an old, uh, if you think about the, like old alarm clocks, um, how they have the flipping numbers. Mm -hmm. um, Groundhog are, Day alarm clock. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> um, there are two of those. Um, one is clearly showing um, sort of uh, how far away it is from here. So it's quickly rapidly rising um another is holding but seems to indicate the time it will take to get back it looks like uh the pod will return in uh roughly five minutes so does it seem like automated yes ah S okay <laughs> we don't know though if sylvia is going to be on it or something is going to be on it <laughs> Yep. It's just going to be like, oh, free pod we can use to follow her. <laughs> yep. Okay. She'll Based relay your... that to to Duncan and Maka. Great. Uh, Maka, uh, you approach uh, the crystalline man. Um, what, uh, what do you attempt to do here? Looking at him, do I understand what's going on? 
Um, can you roll me a nature check or an arcana check? I take either one. I think I'll probably go nature. Um, 18. 18. Um, it looks as though he was once a human man. Um, and that over time, uh, these, these crystalline forms, uh, have, have grown. Um, you can see from the way his face and kind of proportions are twisted and stretched, uh, that, uh, you would expect that these things burst out of him at some point and grew, um, or at least that they weren't like natural, if that makes sense. Um, but, uh, yeah, his proportions are, are, um, uh, sort of bent and, and stretched uh, by by the crystalline structure. That said, um, it's not like he is encased in crystal. It seems as though the crystal is a part of him. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll uh, I'll say to him, uh, "Can you speak?" Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And like one of his hands kind of like flops ineffectually um, at distance, uh, almost as though he'd be reaching out. He says, the amount of energy they were forcing through me was horrific, painful. I am so sorry if it affected you. Mm. It is all right. Mm. I am, I am well. What is this place? Hmm? Well, this is the, the, the Spiros Observatory, center of operations for the fallen house of Dano, a place of great hope, at least in times gone by. There is one named of Dano with us. Um, and his eyes go wide and, uh, his like hand and foot, uh, sort of the remaining appendages he has start flailing. He says, you must, you must run. You must run. Leave them. Leave me. I will hold him off as long as I can. You must run. If Dan or the betrayer is with you, he will kill us all. Uh, uh, Marco will like put his hands up and say, "There is no danger currently. It is all right. What can I call you? My name is Marco Deathcap." Um, and he's still panicked. Um, but uh, also like looking around the room, um, like just darting his eyes stationary from his stationary position, he he calms a little bit. Um, and he says, uh. Uh, my name is, is is Kudo, the pupil, heir of the fallen house of Dano. Or at least I was before this. And he, he looks down at kind of the <laughs> massive crystalline structure jutting out of him. What happened to you, Kudo? How did you come to be this way? Um, and, uh, he, uh, he just kind of shudders, uh, and you, you see, um, a, a jolt kind of travel through the crystal, uh, almost like a, a reflection passing through it. Um, and he says, uh, I was betrayed by my former master. He, he did this to me. Betrayed by Dano. Hmm? The mystic, yes. You've heard of him. The outcast yes. of the Dawnbreakers. The great betrayer. Mm. These titles you put upon him are novel to me. Mm. What was the nature of this betrayal? He did not speak of it much to me and his other pupils and staff. Our role was to help him ply his trade here in the valley. More lies, more tricks, all he was good for in the end. 
The others trusted him. I trusted him. And now I am all that remains. He was cast out of the Dawnbreakers when they realized that the powers he claimed to wield were nothing but trickery, falsehood, and deceptions. And we, we believed he had been wronged, that he was what the legend said. I studied at his feet. And now look at me. Yet another casualty of the cruelty of Dano. Kudo, I do not understand. Why are you like this in this tower? What happened to you? What is this place for? Do you want to roll uh, an insight uh, to see just kind of how how you are are, are processing all of this yeah. and trying to sort through this? Uh, what was the skill? Uh, insight, please. Insight, uh, 17. 17. Um, yeah. Um, I think, Maka, you are... Because you're approaching this as a, a physician, as someone who has an understanding of, of nature and medicine, um, I think there's still, like, the, the story he's telling you makes sense to a degree that you would understand, but none of it has answered the actual fundamental questions you're asking. Um, so I think even just from a medical perspective, this is someone who's dodging questions to some extent. He's giving you useful information, but dodging. Um Duncan, as all of this is going on, um, I guess my question would be, how do you think you'd be busy interrogating Jill and Chris and thus miss this? I feel like that's kind of where my head's at. I think that's what would happen because he's essentially, he doesn't know if Sylvia's coming back right away or if Sylvia's doing something so terrible we need to find a way to sprint there. And also, like, still mission focused. Yeah, absolutely. Also, Kudo's voice is weak. Like, like, like Maka has to stand very close to hear this. It's not like he doesn't have a booming resonant voice, but cool. Great. Just wanted to confirm that. So yeah. it wasn't like cutting out of something that you, you think you'd be uh, a part of. Um, so, um, uh, Kudo continues, um, uh, Dano sought to control the storms. He failed at his other business ventures. And thus he thought as a, a last attempt, he could perhaps gain control as his pupil I offered to assist his apprentice, the heir to his abilities. The cost to me was great, and I have been trapped here amidst the clouds and storms ever since. He could not control them. No one can. And then these monstrosities arrived and channeled energies through me, turned me into a weapon. And um, he, he looks genuinely dismayed and says, uh, I had thought that perhaps I had a purpose I could yet serve as a warning to mariners and others to stay away from this cursed place. But they robbed me even of that. Kudo. What would you have? What would you have us do about your current state? Um, and uh, he just kind of like tries to nod, which is really just his head kind of awkwardly sliding on on the top of the crystal it's wedged into. Um, and uh, he just says. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what can be done for me. I don't know. Dano, he, he, he promised that he would find a way to make this all worthwhile, but then disappeared up. You must be careful if you go up. You may be able to assist me if you can find a way to restore the valley to its natural climate, reduce the storms, 
I might finally be freed. Um, and he like, you can see his hand grasping as though he's trying to like grab your wrist, even though it's far too far away to do it. He says, but you must be fast. You must not linger up there. There is only death. You must be quick. Do not wait. Do not explore. Do not look. Just find the central control system and restore it. Up, up there. Yes. Are you speaking of Orville? Hmm? No, Orville. Oh, yes, the the holding pen for humans. Yes. No, I speak not of that. I speak of of the Nimbus Station, Hmm. of the realm. Of the Thunderers. Realm of the Thunderers, yes. There is a man here, human like you. I would have him speak with you. You may have much to share with each other. Is he the one of Dano you speak? Maka won't answer. But he'll walk away. And uh, as you do, just says, I beg you, do not let him have me. Um, Duncan, you are interrogating Chris and Jill. As no relevant conversations to you or your lineage are discussed. <laughs> yeah, other people are focused <laughs> elsewhere. So I think what he would do is he would gag them both and then he would separate them by enough that they can't easily overhear the other it's a big space you can absolutely do that yeah yep. so nice just just so he's got enough that he's like if he gets a fact from one he can confirm yep. it so he's not just getting bullshitted by somebody he'll start with uh jill because she knows more and she seems to be the only one who made a break for it which makes her the softest target for yep. any conversation that's fair um whatever his equivalent of smelling salts is so let's look for something that smells bad in the lab and make her smell that and then there's plenty. Um, you you notice with dismay that it's a, a bottle with a, a capital D underlined twice, but it looks funky. Like it's got that like uh, uh, salad dressing that's gone off thing, like an oil based salad dressing where you're just like, ooh, this looks gross. So you pop it, and it is even through the mask, you can get a whiff of it uh, yeah. faintly, and it is it is vile. And sure enough, she starts coughing and shaking her head and just being like, huh, huh. Mm! All right, it's time for you and I to have a conversation. Uh, and he'll stop it and put it back on the, the shelf next to them. <sighs> There's no storms in here, right? Other than the smell? Uh, yes, there are no storms. The tunnel seems to have some kind of uh, defense mechanism that is preventing. There's a slight mist coming through, but there's no no actual storms. Okay, he's going to take his mask off because trying to negotiate with someone through a fucking gas mask would be insane. Look, I've seen Kylo Ren interrogate people. I get it. Yeah, yeah take he, that doesn't off. Have, he doesn't have force power, so he'll take it off. Um, now, your name from what I've overheard is Jill. Jill. Your people have lost and you've been taken captive, but we do believe in justice, which means you will be put on trial for the death of those dwarves and the crimes being currently committed. However, there are two ways we can consider this. You are a co-conspirator, someone who believes in this cause, someone who holds tight to their secrets, someone who gives us nothing, and that someone will be executed in an incredibly violent manner for their crimes. Or you're someone who was duped, who did not know the terrible things that have occurred here, who is at best an accessory and even more likely just an innocent victim. That kind of person would share their secrets and their knowledge uh, with great enthusiasm, to have us understand that they do not stand by the acts of this group, but they had been waylaid by Sylvia Tome, the science sack of shite, just like <laughs> even the rest of us have. I'm interested to see where you fall in this camp. Uh, and then he'll undo her gag so she can talk. Um, and uh, she gives you uh, gives you like a look. Um she is uh, she's very clearly defeated like she there's no defiance in it um but there is um 
Duncan, something that you've seen a few times, I think probably back in Orville when particularly like busting up, um, I would guess like this is likely something you encountered, unfortunately, in things like domestic situations where it's just like she's staring. She understands. She gets it. But she's also kind of imploring in, in the way she's kind of mm-hmm. looking at you and, and responding. And she just says, um, it's both. And I don't expect you to, to understand that um, or to, to show mercy to me or, or Chris for that. But it really is both. The mission we're on here, it's it's for the greater good. It's important. It's vital. And we had to do terrible things to accomplish it. But I hope you can understand that we, we did them with with a goal in mind that is, is worth more than any of us. Worth more than... And she kind of like legitimately looks pained. She's like, worth more than Stabo or, or any of us. It, it was horrible, but... It, it it has to be worth it, you know? Well, then explain this goal to me. I'm not an unreasonable man. And uh, her shoulders kind of slump. She says, um, you, you all helped us against the bolts. Um, you, you are a reasonable man. All of you are. We understand that. We, we bear none of you ill will. But the people of Gren are starving and will starve. Our resources are wearing thin and few societies are willing to accept that. But the rate at which we are consuming this world is too high. Sylvia has found a way to feed so many more, to turn the last great blight of the war with the Necrotus into something positive. She's figured out a way to restore the Ashlands, the place where where the Necrotus and his armies made their last stand, the places, the unholy ground, as the more superstitious societies call it. She's figured out how to make it green again, to grow food, to be able to, to turn the last great scar left by that war into something worthwhile and useful. But we need the storms and no one else can have them. The dwarves of Mardi Gras can't have them to power their forges. You and your companions can't have them for whatever purpose you want them. Sylvia needs that power and nothing can stand in our way if we're to stop the famine spreading across this world. How do you know she can do this? And like, there's a small, small smile on her face, despite it all. And she says, she's Sylvia Tome, the science gnome. Yeah, that's what she said before she, you know, blew up a thing and left us all to elemental. So you can understand my faith in Sylvia I, I, yeah, is somewhat lacking. I, I but understand my- that. She's not, she doesn't have this position because of the cool theme song or the bobbleheads or anything else. Those came later. She has it because she is a scientist who dares to believe in larger things, who doesn't care for committees and arguments. If she can pull this off, she will finally have a seat on the executive board of Apex, and we can finally begin the great work of restoring this world. You need to understand, she... Her methods are extreme and admittedly too flashy, but she's the greatest scientist I've ever known, and I literally only know scientists. And Rebecca, who who was a medic, but I don't think she was very good. I think she actually she had a doctorate in arts but she really played the doctor card hard. I think we really thought we were getting a doctor, but I think she killed herself. So maybe that doesn't matter now. And she just kind of like has a moment of like, all of my friends are dead. (laughs) She just kind of stares the floor and then shakes it off and says, um, but nevertheless, 
If anyone can do it, it would be Sylvia. She will break every rule necessary to make this happen. Hmm. The process of healing the Ashlands, how many people die? Um, she does some very quick math and uh, then stops and says, wait, how many of the the dwarven uh, expeditionary force did you save? How many died? Nine. Nine? Yes. Plus our team, at this point, probably about 17. But otherwise, the success of this mission requires no more loss of life. The success of this mission required no loss of life. It was an unfortunate consequence of our method. Interesting. Uh, and he'll regag her. Do you want to roll, uh, before you go and confirm with Chris, yeah. do you want to roll an insight uh, to see how much of this you buy? Yeah, yeah, I really do. That is... So for those of you listening, the death glower on Laura's face through this whole thing is just <laughs> A+. Plus. 21. Uh, 21. Uh, she believes everything she says. There is no hint of a lie in this for her. Uh, she is uh, 100% convinced of what she's saying. Cool. Yeah, I will gag her. Uh, and then we don't need to do the scene with Chris. Chris is literally just getting the core details of... Is it the Ashlands? Because he would just, the question would be like, is it the Ashlands? Like, what? why are you here? Make sure that checks out. Is it this theory? Check out. Would it kill I'm no people? I'm going to need a persuasion marks. or intimidation. Uh, you could roll an advantage because he's uh, bound and gagged, but um, he didn't break, whereas Jill did. Yeah. So this isn't mm -hmm. as clean. Uh, you're not getting someone just being like, here it is. <laughs> okay, yeah. If, if he's going to do the stoic thing up front, then yeah, we can, we can actually play this out a little bit. We don't necessarily like, need to. I mean, wanted... like, you, you can tell me what your approach is, then roll a dice, and we'll see how much confirmation you get. Okay, yeah. We'll lean into, I think it's a persuade with, as always with Duncan, there's an undercurrent of a little bit of intimidate, but it's literally sure. a persuade. Because if, if this is logically true, if Chris tells him that's the truth, and it matches with Jill's truth, then there are things that can be considered. If Chris lies and Jill lies, we kill Sylvia Gnome when she comes out of that pod and justice is done. Yeah. But that means whatever they're doing is real bad. So please tell me so that there's a chance if you're doing something good, we can save that. Right. That's his persuasion. Um, Nat one. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan gets the twenties when you need him in combat and just eats fucking shit in, in in anywhere else, which matches his life. Yeah. So Chris, <laughs> now don't um, tell me the truth. I mean, tell me the truth. Oh shit. <laughs> Chris uh, just kind of shakes his head and says, um, "Oh, and sorry, Ryan, give me give me the Duncan line that would lead into this, so I know how to respond after a one." Christ. Yeah. Literally going to open a new beer for this. Do you give me your line while I crack this. Here's the, the thing, friend. I would like this to be a situation where we can move forward logically because you say you're scientific people. And if what Jill has told me is true and you tell me the same story, then Sylvia Gnome can be a discussion when she returns. And there's a chance that your dreams can come true. But if you stonewall me, friend, I gotta risk just shooting Sylvia in the face the next time I see her. I don't know if you know what this is, uh, but uh, there's a thing called a Petri dish. It's a small circular glass container we use to study uh, life at its, its very uh, fundamental core, the building blocks of, of existence. Um, often when looking at, at the, uh, the specimens in a Petri dish through microscope, uh, they'll die or they'll disappear or they'll squish if someone pushes the slide too hard. When the thing in the Petri dish demands answers, you don't give them to the thing in the Petri dish. So go ahead. If you think you can kill Sylvia, be my guest. Shoot her in the head when she comes back. That would 
be appropriate, wouldn't it? You know? But know that you'll be killing this world because you are the bacteria that makes this world sick. And Sylvia is trying to cure this world, not destroy you, just cure this world. But as bacteria, as a virus, I'm sure you'll do everything in your power to stop that and ruin this world yet again. So you know what? Go ahead. Uh, and then I'll just regag him and be like, thank you for confirming she thinks she's saving the world. I love when smart people are just a little bit stupid. Uh, and then I'm just going to sock him one so hard he's unconscious. I sure, go you, with my, my hand. You crack right. his jaw. He's like, again, he's he's a science gnome. Yeah. He's a square-jawed science gnome, but still a science gnome. Duncan's hand fucking hurts because he's yeah. not like that great at punching. But he's It's like, oh, fine. Like, he's not that great at having a jaw. So he bounces off yeah. like... A table and like a few bottles crack off him uh, and roll away. They don't shatter. They, which is also somewhat more embarrassing, just kind of yeah. bounce off him um, and roll away. He's gonna like triple tie Chris because clearly he's a diehard, so you don't go casual with fanatics. Uh, yep. And double tie Jill. I mean, he got absolutely nothing out of that guy. Ostensibly, he just wanted to tell him something that would possibly make him angrier before he knocked him out because. Duncan, despite his love of justice and the belief that most things are worthy of a sentence of death, does not believe a cat like a prisoner should be able to make you angry enough you kill them. That's not Dawnbreaker. Yeah. Like this motherfucker gets a trial of some kind. But I mean, um, also, as Chris put it, you are only human. So a little bit of rage makes sense. You know? Yeah, yeah. All that shit. Uh he'll just give probably give these fuckers to the dwarves. Um and then he will go see what's going on with the rest of the team because we I, probably meeting on the second floor. I think he'd head up because he'd want to know where Sylvia was at. Mm -hmm. Crystal guy, interesting, probably solved post. Oh, shit. Someone's trying to either save, destroy somewhere between the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, would you spend now having seen the, the Dano logo everywhere? Would you spend any time on that or is I actually I think I've answered my own question. I imagine everything that's happening is so present that you wouldn't care yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, fair enough. Right There's too now, much stakes and time. You can check later. When yeah. he gets back, he can look into it. It doesn't seem like from what we've seen, he A, he doesn't know the fucking guy in the tube is, knows answers. Uh, and B, he's not a guy who would be able to put together facts based on looking at careful yep. evidence and clues no, that's fair. quickly. No, I so. get that. All right. So you yeah. uh, you you take the, the blasted out ladder um, surrounded by the, the shreds of Rebecca Chambers. Uh, up to uh, the second floor to uh, to go meet up with Ida. Uh, Ida, you're able to quickly explain uh, the the dials, which I'm sure would be vaguely confusing to Duncan. I mean, in the ballpark of understanding, but <laughs> like again, we're hitting a weird nexus point of of technology you know and technology you don't. Yeah. Um. So it's familiar, but also strange. Ida explains it, um, and you can see that uh, the pod is now starting to return. So you have about three minutes until the pod. Uh, is back. Uh, and I, Duncan and Lena would be like, Marco, you got about two minutes before we're going to need to have a real quick chat. He yells and I over think the side. Based on what Tyler ended his conversation with, he's already at, coming up. Like, yeah, I was going to say, he turns. It, it sinks, right there. It, well, no, like <laughs> you, you, you turn in, like Maka's like walking up and kind of nods and climbs the ladder. So the three of you uh, have converged on the second floor. Um, the the pod is returning. Uh, Maka, is there anything you convey to them? You do have a couple of minutes, which again in D and D time is like a fucking year and a half. Yeah. Like we can mm -hmm. do three seasons between now and that pod returning. So like, <laughs> Maka will 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 say, uh, um, "Our work here is not." complete correct sylvia is returning in looks out at pod no oh, about three minutes so we're gonna need to figure out what the fuck we're doing with sylvia gnome assuming she's in Ooh. it otherwise this thing goes back and forth and we've got to go up which feels also possible and likely we so must go up quick information from prisoners uh i got good information from one if it's true and the other one told me to go fuck myself so i don't really have confirmation it appears, which explains the random defense suicides, which are terrifying, this group all believe that they know how to turn the Ashlands into some sort of veritable fruit basket of growing, where Sylvia Tome believes she can go to the Ashlands and turn them all into some farmland that'll be very verdant because the world is starving. If I can briefly cut in, um, all of you would be aware of the Ashlands, uh, including you, Duncan, uh, mm -hmm. just vicariously. This would definitely fold into... Um, 
Dawnbreaker mythology. Uh, the Ashlands are where um, Asher Tamlin made his last stand. Uh, it's where um, uh, Amala and the Dawnbreakers and the united armies of the entirety of Gren faced off against the the Necrotus Horde. This would be like the Mordor of Gren. Um, and upon uh, the uh, defeat of the armies, um, there were still a few more conflicts that followed. This wasn't the final battle, but it was um, in modern historical context, almost like the Normandy of Gren, where by breaking the army in what is now the Ashlands, um, they were able to um, hunt down Asher over a span of years, uh, more battles, but this broke kind of, this was like the beachhead moment. A weird mix of like D-Day and um, Hiroshima uh, in that in order to do it, they destroyed the continent, basically. So the Ashlands have been, they're, they're literally the only no-fly zone in Gren. Everyone, including uh, the Covenant of Cricket, avoids it. Uh, it is universally similar to like Chernobyl now, viewed as just like a don't fucking go there zone. Um, nothing grows there. Nothing lives there. It is an ashen wasteland. Uh, it is the northwest continent of Gren, and it has just been uh, generally abandoned. It's big, but useless. So, uh, Ita, for you, this would seem a flight of fancy because it is widely acknowledged that this is literally and figuratively scorched earth. Yeah. Maka, you would have heard of it, I think, only because the idea of a place where nothing can grow would be important to you. So you were aware of it, but it was so far away you didn't really care. And Duncan, you would know about it because it's mythologically important to the Duncan. history of the war. Yeah, that mm-hmm. would all sit within his things. Yeah, I think Ida, Ida would say it's like, Given what we have witnessed of Sylvia Tom's methods, I do not believe that she has the noble intentions. I also do not believe that simply bringing storms to this place could bring forth life. I believe she is doing, as we have learned, she does shoddy science. I mean, I would agree with that. I think what I can confirm is these people believe it would work, but they have seen no proof. They're trusting on reputation, which yes, is... Yes, they wild. are what I used and to be, a fanatic. They believe that this methodology and this change will save everyone with no loss of life involved, which seems admirable until you murdered nine dwarves and one member of your own party to get here instead of having a conversation. So I see a lot of red flags in the overall behavior, However, if she can't do it, it's not bad. Uh, Duncan is deeply conflicted in his brain because he knows a definitive Duncan answer to this problem, but he is acknowledging there are problems beyond him, and he is no longer beholden to a crown that would make this decision for him where he got to foist off moral relativism. I think Ida would like to say, um, if she could do it, that means that others can do it as well. But I do not believe that her methods are the correct way to achieve this. Does the Maka. claim that the world is starving make sense to Maka? Um, you can roll a history check at disadvantage. Unfortunately, Maka, your worldview is so limited that I don't know that you would have an answer to this. Ita, would you know? Because you know numbers and are from the Empire. Duncan would not know fucking shit. So uh, Ita likely wouldn't because the Empire yeah. is very, very um, specialized. Well, no, it's uh, it's um, it's very well off. Um, it's a little bit like uh, in again modern world terms. This is a little bit like saying like a far flung nation you've never heard of is in trouble. But you're the world. like a white yeah. straight person living in America and you have like a six-figure income. It would be very hard to understand what that 
looks like, you know? It's so for necessarily recognize like systemic shortcomings. I mean, Ida might be aware that they exist, but she wouldn't have any additional insight in it because right. the Empire actually kind of doesn't care because the Empire is very focused on its own thing. Also, the Empire of Numbers, I, I don't think we've we've necessarily talked about this, but it's a big fucking place. Mm. Like it's not like a, a small, like it's not like a, a you know, a single Kingdom citadel that everyone lives in. Like it's a full empire. Um, that just deals in numbers and kind of helps with accounting, but also is dogged in its pursuit of, um, you know, uh, mathematical excellence and everything else. Um, but it's a lush and fertile space. Um, you can kind of think, like I've always thought of it in, um, and we talked about kind of Aztec and Mayan uh, uh, sort of technology um, a few episodes ago. Um, but it really is like lush jungle, lots of natural occurring resources, food, clean mm. water, like they've got everything they need. And as a result, they can afford to just spend time in quiet contemplation and study because all of their basic needs are met by the land they're on, but that's the land they're on. So I don't right. think Ida would have any insight. Maka, you might, but odds are bad. Duncan well, certainly nine. wouldn't. Yeah, I'm Duncan, not even Realistically, trying. again, all of you are, and it's, it's interesting because Ida should in theory have more answers, but she's also like low on the ladder in a very yeah. academic society that is self-sustaining and yeah. is very well off. She had, so, had, I think she probably had blinders to anything that wasn't what she was studying. Well, I also feel like in a lot of ways, like food is the thing that comes from the cafeteria for you. Yeah. Right? Like you've never seen farming. You don't know what farming is. Yeah. It's like you go to the cafeteria yeah, and food arrives for you. There's never been a the thought yeah. to, to where, where it comes from. And similarly, Maka, I mean, like uh, Bleen is a, is a well-positioned place at the center of everything. But um, you weren't interested. I mean, weirdly, you and Doc Malvern kind of have a similar streak, which is you're very concerned about what's in front of you and the people who live near you and that kind of local community sense. So you'd be the person who's like, I got to build a garden here. Edom might be like, I understand municipal politics, but unfortunately, none of right. you are versed in international situations. Uh, Maka will say, uh, um, we must defend this tower from who or whatever is coming back and kudo the one the crystalline man is urged us to ascend to this nimbus place sorry nimbus station thank you Yep. And I think, Ida, you would jump in with that because this yeah. is an yeah. improper labeling of a space. Yes. <laughs> Urged us to ascend to Nimbus Station to put an end to the manipulation of the storms. All Duncan, right. there is a talk you will have to have with this man. Does it need to happen now, or can we do it after we possibly apprehend the fugitive or save I think the island? Looking up at this, I mean, can we see this descending? You, thing? you can't. No. It's it's pure dark clouds okay. outside. But um, the what you're the way you're determining how far away the pod is is by the the flicking numbers on the little groundhog day clock. Okay, Maka will say, um, "I am afraid this will have to wait." Uh, All right, he's. He he's gonna basically uh, ready his uh, shield and mace, and he'll say, um, "I still yet have some power. Can I provide aid to anyone before?" I would not object to some healing," says Duncan, who's like a train wreck of bullet wounds and lightning blasts and shit. Ita, can you roll me in? Insight or a medicine, please. Uh, I sure can. Um, I'll do an insight. Nat 20. Ooh. Oh, Ooh. baby. Um, based on your early experience of gaining some hit points back from one of the shattered bottles, um, you realize that uh, whatever the House of Dano is seem to have stocked a bunch of vaguely medicinal things. Um, it won't give any healing, but uh, with a nat 20, I was going to say you can go look for it, but I'll just give this to you if you roll <laughs> a nat 20. Um, you'll be able to uh, remove your exhaustion. Uh, oh, that's Duncan, nice. Um, by drinking a truly disgusting concoction 
of uh, okay. like vinegary uh, expired potions, but enough so that it will cure your exhaustion for now <laughs> and will hurt a lot when it wears off. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Duncan can recover uh, 11 hit points. Oh, uh, well done, sir. How, how is he? How is he looking with that? Um, right now you would say like before he looked like he was closing in on the final rounds of losing a boxing match right now. He'd look like he's mid fight. You know, we're round five holding his own, but he has taken five rounds worth of hits. I'll, uh, I'll cast it again. That's better. That's, um, seven and eight, 15, uh, HP. He's, he's looking good now. This this would be Duncan. You've seen him before, probably, you know, a couple of days after a battle. He's still got some bruises, but he's looking looking solid. The guy who won the fight doing the press conference the next day. Okay. That's, I think, where you would see him uh, looking at now. Uh, and he'd look at the other two and say, A, thank you. That's excellent. And B, I think I've got a solution for Sylvia Tome, but we need to take it alive. Hmm. Then I will provide assistance for an ambush. Uh, and Maka is relatively uninjured, but he looks tired. You know, he's broken mm -hmm. a sweat at this point, uh, and and basically kind of like strains and winces uh, and casts path pass without trace on us. Nice. Um, as he's uh, he's basically kind of running out of. Uh, Running out of fuel here, but um, so I know the end result is plus ten to stealth checks. Uh, let me just get the particulars up here if it's required. So Tom, we've basically just taken like Adderall, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or caffeine if we want to stay. Yeah, or or room. you've chugged. I'm just thinking a, of something that hits you really hard yeah, afterwards, <laughs> like Adderall. You chugged a Red Bull, or you've okay. just snorted some cocaine. It, We're gonna it, crash. It, it, it will later, patch. Okay. It'll patch you up for now. It's gonna hurt on the back end, but it at least gets you um, okay up up and going. Cool. Um, as long as you stay within thirty feet of me, you will each gain plus ten to stealth. Oh, nice. Then I imagine with our new stealthy, magically hidden selves, we position ourselves around the pod so that we can, because mm -hmm. the pod when it opens, are we talking like Dr. Evil's pod and Austin Powers, Tom? Yes, what's actually, our... exactly. Yeah. But if that was <laughs> attached to a gondola, um, oh, okay. so like on a, and it's so weird that gondolas are like both boats and like things at Alpine resorts. But like, if you're at a ski lodge yeah. or going up a mountain, it's literally just like, I mean, you've seen them in James Bond movies. It's mm -hmm. like, or in any video game where they're like, we need a space. We're just in a small thing. You shoot your way up. In this case, it's a, it's a circular, like a, an almost an egg shaped, very Apple store, um, silver pod with a Dr. Evil door that swings down. There are, uh, no windows in it. Um, it is fully enclosed, but yes, mm. that's <laughs> Dr. Evil pods, a very good, uh, mode for this, but right. larger, large well, enough that you could all sit in it comfortably, not like. You know, you and Mr. Bigglesworth. Duncan will position himself to kind of be in behind it so that he can swing out to hit whoever comes out from behind uh, if they're in it and come out. Great. Uh, Maka and Ita. Maka is going to, I mean, we all have to kind of stay, you know, together. So Maka, I think, will take up position on the other side. Mm. Okay. And Ita? Um, there's no way to get above it, right? No, because it's, it's swinging on the down. top floor. Okay. I mean, you could like try and climb and like hang in the ceiling, but <laughs> it's not really built for that. No, nah, that's that seems a little bit ridiculous. Um, yeah. I think what I'll do is I'll I'll stand kind of uh to the side of like where the the door will open, like but further away, just in case anything that affects uh, Duncan and Maka, like kind of anything immediately around it, won't get all of us. Okay. Great. Um, you wait in tense and awkward silence as the numbers keep clicking down. Uh, and then as before, this pod just fucking wails in at a high speed, um, slamming on brakes clearly as it, as it gets closer to the buffer, but, uh, it's not a, not a clean landing by any stretch. 
Uh, it hits the bumpers, kind of like uh, what you'd find at the end of a train line um, to just kind of stop it. Uh, and it kind of rumbles. And then with a hiss, uh, the pod door opens. Um, no one is inside. Uh, mm. You can see blood, um, a lot of blood uh, in the pod. Um, but it is uh, it is empty. Um, aside from uh, some, uh, there's a, a crate, uh, or sorry, a... Um, a barrel, rather. I got a one of two shot from that based on the store. Um, there's a barrel uh, with a crack in it, and um, the uh, the carpeting inside is stained, kind of a dark brown uh, that, that's clearly grown crusty uh, with time. Um, you oh, see, so like the bar- it looks like the barrel's leaked out? Like it leaked out a long yeah, time okay. ago, yeah. Um, it's a large pod. Uh, again, you can think of this almost as like a, like an RV, so like a, a big, big-ish space. Um, inside there are benches lining both sides, um, some old, uh, disused, uh, machinery that you don't quite understand. There's clearly a lever that's like the let's go lever. Um, also you see two, uh, abandoned, uh, champagne glasses and a, um, a, uh, a chilling container with, uh, yeah. an ancient bottle of champagne in it. Uh, that is open and empty. Um, it's been knocked over. There's a smear of blood. Um, and uh, you can see uh, several cigarettes burnt into the carpet. Uh, new the, or uh, old? New. Okay. Uh, clearly the uh, the leavings of Sylvia Tome, the science gotcha. gnome. Well, friends, shall we take an incredibly stealthy ride towards Nimbus Station, a possible ambush and a decision that could affect the world? Yes, The boons provided by this magic of mine are long-lasting. We will still be difficult to detect leaving this place. Yes, we must make an end of Sylvia Tom, the science gnome. And with that, you pile into the pod, uh, the door closes, and with a jolt, uh, you begin to ascend. Um... The three of you, I think, at this point, being kind of roughed up, sit in relative silence, unless there's anything you wanted to discuss that you haven't. But I think with the the, the gravity of your situation weighing upon you, um, you take in the surroundings uh, that I've described. None of them mean anything to you in particular. Duncan, you do note that the barrel has uh, the House of Dano logo, as you'd expect at this point. Um, Duncan actually would have something that he would say to the others once they were part of the way up because he'd realize it at the last minute. And he'd be like, friends, I don't know if you've tried to take in prisoners or criminals before, but there is one rule, which is take them alive if you can. But if it will cost you your life or the life of the people with you, you don't take them alive. No matter what they say they have, no matter how important they are, don't sacrifice yourself or one of the others for them. What we've learned is important, but don't let that weigh on your conscience or slow your hand. As I have said, the research can be completed by others. Guiding others from life into death has never weighed heavily on Marcus' conscience. All right, so I'm the troubled one. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> and then I think he'll lapse back into quiet yep. and continue. Um, the pot is struck several times by lightning as it ascends, uh, but uh, you just feel it as kind of thumps and thrums against the the outside of the, the metallic container. Um, and then suddenly uh, you, you all kind of get jostled as the brakes engage, uh, as you, you've seen uh, lower down, your ears pop uh, with, with altitude. And uh, the pod uh, slows to a stop. Um, and uh, you hear kind of like a, a subway, like, boom, boom, as the uh, sealed doorway pops open. Um, and uh, you're immediately hit by a, a cool, beautiful, fresh breeze. Uh, you're looking upon um, just the, the light of a, a brilliant blue sky. Uh, and the as the ramp lowers, uh, there's a puff of uh, of a thin, um, wispy substance uh, as it seems to touch down on cloud. Uh, and as the three of you stealthily make your way out of the pod, um, Duncan, I think immediately your eyes being drawn to the the blood stains on this this soft, puffy white uh, seem to lead away from the pod. Uh, the three of you find yourselves standing on a cloud. 
uh, far above the storms, far above Gren, a brilliant blue sky above you, and massive structures, uh, easily 50, 60 feet tall uh, on all sides, strung between them a huge gargantuan banner reading, Welcome, Dano the Mystic. And nearby, laying down feet facing you, a massive 30-foot-tall corpse. <laughs> As the three of you find yourselves in Nimbus Station, home of the Storm Giants. This episode of Curse Code and Crowd Sound was mixed and edited by Laura Hamstra, and the campaign was created by Tom McGee. Our original theme music was composed by Landon Noblock, and Curse Code and Crown's artwork was created by the brilliant Del Barovic. If you want to follow our players or our DM on Twitter, you can reach out to Laura at EL Hamstring, Ryan at the Ryan LeBlanc. Tyler at Tyler underscore Hewitt, Tom McGee at McGee TD, or you can message our whole company at Dum Dum Dice. So please join us again for more Curse Code and Crown! Dum Dums and Dice has to give a special thank you to the supreme beings of our Patreon at this time the Half Blind Prophet, Christopher Little, Sue One, George Dolby, Lord Abradovic, Orion Birchfield, Scott Garland, Benjamin V, Gavin and Abby McDonald, Cade Peters, Richard Cranium, Anna Zed, Logan, Fire on Friendly, Acrix, Grandma Likes D&D, Alan, Austin Not Powers Fry, Stabby Stranger, Roman Brown, and Jill and Noel LaPlante. If you want your name to be added to this list, you can join our Patreon too at patreon.com slash dumdumdice. Thanks to them, and a little bit of thanks to you.